and thanks for joining us for another edition of Mid-American Gardener at Home. I'm your host, Tanisha Spain. And of course, we've got our panelists on the show today who will be bringing their show and tells and also answering some of your questions. So let's have them introduce themselves and tell you a little bit more about their specialty. So Kelly, we'll start with you. My name is Kelly Alsup, and I am a horticulture educator based out of Bloomington. And my specialty is integrated pest management, which is kind of surprising that I'm so good at killing insects because I actually love insects. I love talking about pollinators and beneficial insects and pests and how to control them organically. That's really my passion in horticulture. All right, wonderful. And Kay. Hi, I'm Kay Carnes. I'm a Champaign County Master Gardener, and my specialty is herbs and vegetables, um, especially heirloom vegetables. So um, I'll answer any questions in that line. Wonderful. And last but not least, John. Hi, I'm John Bodensteiner. I'm a Vermilion County Master Gardener. I live in a little town called Bismarck, just north of uh, Danville. My interests are vegetables, um, Shade perennials, especially hostas. I like shrubs and trees and just about anything that grows. Wonderful. Okay, sounds good. So uh, everybody's got show and tells today. So Kelly, we'll start with you. What'd you bring us? So um, when master gardeners find out that you are obsessed with insects and you know love everything about them, then they bring you little presents. And I had a Woodford County Master Gardener bring me this, mm. which oh. instills fear in some people, but it's either, I, I don't know for sure exactly what kind of wasp nest it is. It's either a yellow jacket or um, I'm thinking a bald face um, hornet. And what they do is they use um, dead wood to make their nests. Mm -hmm. Um, they chew it up and put and use it. And so it makes this really beautiful kind of marbled effect. And then they have several layers of um, nests within this big, huge nest. And they're raising their young all summer long. And um, the queen overwinters and she starts by laying uh, other female workers and they start to build this. Now, if you were, these, this is usually up in the tree. And if you were to see this, um, most people would want to get rid of it. But, um, you know, uh, yellow jackets and bald face hornets, you know, they go out there and they, you know, they eat caterpillars and they eat um, other insects, uh, uh, mainly bad insects. Um, yellow jackets, uh, don't really pollinate, but the bald-faced hornets do. Um, if you were to have something like this, just know that if you wait it out for a season, they are not going to use this nest again next year, which is why I was able to get this. And if you wanted to get rid of a nest, one of the things that you would have to do is you'd have to kill all those wasps before you get rid of the nest, which could be um, a very, uh, very big task. So I would call a professional, but if you're willing to take it most of the time, they're not going to sting when they're away from their nest. They might be a little bit more protective near the nest. Um, so just a really cool, cool, like, I, I love it. It looks like art, you know, wasp making art in your backyard. Some people <laughs> love it. Some people may not like it, but, uh, um, so I have a question. Is yeah. this just one family that lives in here or is this like an apartment complex where everyone can kind of come in and go to their own wing per se? Well, it's a colony. Okay. So there's only one queen. Okay. Sort of bees, mm -hmm. bees where there's one queen and there's a caste system. Um, so, uh, you know, there's worker bee, worker, uh, w worker wasps, mm -hmm. the yellow jackets or the bald face hornets, uh, and um, they're, they're producing young all summer long. Wow. Fascinating. So is that bigger than a basketball? I mean, just for 
Oh, it's like bigger than a basketball. Wow. It's very it's cool. Large. I, I don't want to touch it because it's, you know, it's very brittle and mm-hmm. I don't want it to fall apart, but um, it's, it's really cool. If you could see inside, which is probably not the best, you can see some, oh, that didn't <laughs> So much for touching it. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's see, see if how... I can get it. Let's see if I can get the camera angle of you seeing inside. Oh, Ooh, yeah. I can. Yeah, you can see. In so there. those are the little individual nests. Yeah. There can be, a, you know, a huge colony. But, you know, it goes back to, you know, uh, I'm a beneficial insect person. These are beneficial mm-hmm. in nature. Um if you're allergic to stings like that, then maybe you need to control it. But if you're not and you're willing to last it out for a season, I wouldn't control it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That was awesome. Very good teaching material. Appreciate that. Thank you. Kelly. Okay. Kay, what show and tell do you have today? Well, as always, I have tomatoes. I hope <laughs> you can be able to see these. Um, this one is uh, called Marilinga. It's kind of a brown tomato. And this one is probably going to take up the whole screen. It's called Russian Swirl, and it looks a lot like a pineapple tomato. And what's special about these tomatoes is they are dwarf tomatoes. And so they only get about three feet tall, but they're very stocky. And they have large leaves. And as you can see, they produce full-size tomatoes. These are really big. This the pen. Russian swirl is especially large. Um, And I got interested in them this year. It's kind of a new old thing. And there's, uh, if people are interested in these tomatoes, they can Google um, dwarf tomato uh, project and it'll describe how um, these were found and how they're developing now. Um, You can get seed. uh, Most of the smaller, a lot of the seed companies are smaller than that have these, um, but they're really nice because you can grow them in pots. They're great. They're really great for pots, but you're going to get a really nice harvest of tomatoes. So I have, I have some in a pot and then I have the rest out in the garden uh, with the big tomatoes. So it's been a fun thing. <laughs> okay. How has your growing season been? You know, it's been, we, we were really wet in the spring and then we went through a dry snap. So, and I know with tomatoes, they're sort of sensitive to that. So do you just maintain a, a watering schedule or how do you work around? Yes, that? I have soaker hoses on my entire garden. And so I run them at different times, you know, different sections at different times. So I can get even watering um, on the tom- on all the um, garden. And mm-hmm. it's been a kind of a strange year. The, the, gar- the beans and the tomatoes and the peppers are doing fantastic. Um, my vining things, my squash and my cucumbers are really struggling. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think they like this, the heat at all. I had a good pea crop early on, um, because it was cool. Too. Yeah. Uh, I had good peas too. John said he did as well. Right. Um, the tomato my peppers, did. peppers are struggling and uh, squash is struggling. Oh yeah. The squash. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But my peppers are really doing well. I also have eggplant, and they're they're doing great. Mm-hmm. Um, apparently, they don't mind. Uh, but I've done a lot of hand watering too because I have things that aren't, you know, on the soaker. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But the, the soaker hoses are great because um, you know it's it's a slow release mm-hmm. of water, and I and um, I just rotate them every day and run a different soaker hose. <laughs> Nice, nice. Okay. All right, John, what did you have today? Okay, I, I brought a plant in. I, a lot of people are familiar with snake plant, but mine are going to bloom, which is not very often do they bloom. They're, uh, this is the blossom, and um, they haven't opened yet, but there's small white flowers, and there's a couple of stems, if you notice. And this is the variegated snake plant. and and then I've also got a um, spider plant. And if you can see, the ends are all, the tips are all dead. And that's because I've been using city water. I had these at the greenhouse and that's all I had. I didn't have any rainwater. And that's because of the fluoride in the, in the water. 
and other minerals, and it blocks the xylem and phloem at the very tip because it gets very small and they dry up. So if you see that, um, use rainwater, and and then <laughs> as as the new leaves come out, you'll notice that the tips do not dry off. And I just had one thing to show on this, in in that if you notice that it was variegated, and this is one of the variegated leaves, and and you can um, propagate new leaves or new plants from this just by taking the leaf and cutting it like that mm -hmm. and then just stick this into some wet sand uh, and i'd stick it about halfway or three quarters of the way and all of a sudden you'll notice a shoot coming off the side you want this part here won't grow but you'll you'll get the shoots from the side one important thing is that you want to make sure that the bottom is is the part you you plant and the unfortunate part of this is that this is a variegated. When you get the new shoots, they will not be variegated. They revert back to the to the old um, white and um, and green. They don't have the nice yellow stripes. We've tried a number of things trying to get them to to propagate into this um, nice var variegation, mm -hmm. but we have not had it. The best way is if you can see i've got babies coming up here and mm -hmm. they just put up new shoots and the best way to get those is just to cut them off and once they get a little bit bigger they'll have their own root system put them in a in a in their own pot just make sure they're watered for a while these things are are really carefree I, mm -hmm. i'd say water every other week they're also really one of the most efficient plants at air purification. So they'll release a lot of oxygen, take out a lot of carbon dioxide. So a lot of people grow them in, in their bedrooms. Mm -hmm. so I've got one in my room. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, John. And we'll come back to you for your for your other show and tell. Okay. Uh, Kelly, we're going to go to you. Question number 908. Um, Carrie writes in, we have this nest on the brick of our home and wondered if you knew what it was. Thank you for your time. Look forward to the show each week. So let's see what we are working with here. All right, what is that? Um, it's a Carolina praying mantis egg case. Um, we find these in the spring. Um, they're flat and they're usually attached to something. Um, we we also they're much smaller uh, praying mantises than the big huge ones. The Chinese praying mantises. And the Chinese praying mantises egg case are bulbous and they're usually kind of attached to like ornamental grasses or shrubs. And so I always warn people when they're cutting stuff back in the spring to make sure you're not, you know, throwing these uh, egg cases uh, in the compost. And so that hundreds of little baby praying mantis will emerge in the spring. Um, I don't, um, I don't know for sure if that one had, had, had already hatched yet. It usually, you can usually tell when they've hatched or come mm -hmm. and then they just start scurrying away looking for food. Most of the time it's each other mm -hmm. and only one or two make it. Oh. But praying mantis can be a really good sign that you have a good ecosystem in your garden when you see praying mantis. Uh, they are generalist. They will eat a honeybee as well as they'll eat um, a bad caterpillar. So um, they'll eat butterflies, um, but just really cool to have them in the garden. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's where the old adage comes from that if you see them, it's good luck because they do show that there's a healthy ecosystem. Maybe that's where that came from. If, if you see one of the, the, the large ones hanging around your hummingbird feeder, you probably want to move it because they have been known to kill a hummingbird. Really? So, yes. Um, so if just, just move them, don't kill them, just move them because mm -hmm. they are so beneficial. I had uh, one of those eggs, the, the round this, this spring and I moved it 
into a sheltered area. And I just happened to be sitting there when they hatched and they were literally crawling everywhere, hundreds and hundreds of them. And I just went around the yard and so they wouldn't eat each other. <laughs> dropped, dropped them off all over the yard. And so I'm expecting a, a bunch of them this, this uh, fall. Wow, a labor of love, trying to save them from themselves. <laughs> That's yeah, right. Tanisha, you can Google praying, uh, praying mantis murders hummingbird YouTube, and you will see this large praying mantis grab that hummingbird from the air and start. Wow. I might have to watch that with my boys. I think that's something <laughs> that the boys will <laughs> they'll get into. <laughs> I used to show it in master gardener training and they got a little irritated with me. Yeah. Hey, it's the circle of life, right? That's right. It is. I mean, it is. They're going to go for, they're a generalist. They're going to go for whatever they can catch. Whatever. Whatever's yeah. moving. Okay. On that note, okay, we're coming to you. <laughs> uh, question 901, Jim and Carrie write in, uh, they want some ideas about how to keep squirrels out of their pots. And I've had this problem too, so I am all ear. So what, what are some tips? This is very appropriate for me because we have a ton of squirrels this year. Um, and they get up on our porch um, and they do get in the pots. I can always tell because there's potting soil all over mm -hmm. the place. But they've been in there. And my suggestion would be to put like um, chicken wire or, or some kind of mesh wire around your plant and, you know, just uh, lay it on top of the soil um, because they would, you know, they wouldn't like that when they, you know, give in a, a, and it's going to pull on their feet and they won't, I probably won't like that, you know, get tangled. They may get tangled in it, but um, I, I can't just lay it on top of the soil. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of, you know, maybe um, around the, the base mm -hmm. of the plant and in, in just, to the, out to the edge of the a pot. Okay. Um, I think that would probably help a lot. I wonder, have you ever used a bird net just for it, its pliability? I wonder oh, if that yeah. would. That might, yeah. but I, I don't know if it would. Um, when you said they, they would get tangled up, I thought bird, bird uh, net would yeah. tangle them up for that, sure. I mean, yeah, that's worth it. Anything's worth a try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. Okay. All right. You, you could done. probably do noise deterrence too, like um, crinkly paper. Another thing mm. to find with people who have lots of issues with squirrels, they are feeding birds. Mm -hmm. Bird feeder? Yes. They empty my bird feeder. Repeatedly. So that could be, I mean, I, I don't want to be mean to the birds, but if you're constantly having problems with squirrels, maybe um, stop feeding the birds because yeah. they are be attracted to that. Yeah, that is true. I have a lot of issues with squirrels. And I think it's because I it doesn't mean that I don't have less squirrels than Tanisha or Kay. I think it means that they just know they, you know, I don't have, I don't feed birds. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. That's a good point. Okay. John, we're back to you with your second show and tell item. Oh, okay. Uh, <clears throat> the other plant I brought in from outside, and I had this at the greenhouse all winter also. This is called a ZZ plant. And, um, it's called ZZ plant because the name is very long. It's Zamicolus zamiflora, which is, there's two Z's. It's a native of Africa. Um, but it's also a very good plant to have indoors for new homes because a lot of new homes have a... Uh, solvent called xylene in, in some of the walls. And this is one of the best plants as far as absorbing xylene out of the air. Um, another nice thing is this plant can live up to four months if you forget to water it. So uh, the unfor another one unfortunate thing is it is toxic to eat. So don't eat it. But And, and if you have pets, I would 
that eat plants, I would not have this in, in the house either. But uh, other than that, it's, it is so pretty green and it's shiny green, <clears throat> shiny green leaves um, and uh, just carefree. And it's, mm -hmm. it's one of those plants that is, is really nice. Um, here you can see I've got a new shoot coming. That's a lighter green, but it, it'll light, it'll darken up once it gets a little bit more mature and uh, just a really easy, easy, easy plant. And you can get them at, at a lot of where you, if you see the tropical plants, they're getting to be quite popular. Also, if you notice, the leaves are not on one side of the stem. The leaves are usually on just the uh, two sides. So you have mm -hmm. a bear, that's a really easy way to tell that you have a ZZ and that you're gonna have one side of the stem with no leaves on it. When we get back into the studio, I'll have to bring mine. I have an enormous one and it's about time for it to be split. And I've heard that is quite an ordeal. So uh, yeah, they, are tuberous. <laughs> they are tuberous. So you'll need a good saw or something, but they, they do, you can mm -hmm. do it that way and, and get many more plants. And mm -hmm. like I say, they're so easy to take care of. So. Okay. Thank you very much, John. All right, Kelly, we're going to you. Question 909. This is from Joe Love. My grandson found what appeared to be about 17 baby Katie dids. They looked as though something had attacked them and they were either dead or dying when found. Do you know what could have caused this and what predator could be responsible? So she wants to know who did this to the Katie dids. Well, of course, I can't say without a doubt exactly what it is, but I suspect birds. Mm. Because, um, you know, uh, there are wasps out there that use katydids. Um, they, uh, wasp will catch a katydid and they're similar to cicada killers where a, a cicada killer wasp will catch a cicada, take it back to their underground nest, they'll paralyze it and then they'll lay an egg on it and then they'll section off the little nest and that, that katydid is you know, uh, paralyzed future food for a wasp larva. Not the best life, but... Uh, Kelly uh, keeps getting all the scary movie explanations. <laughs> and, you know, I love it, too. I'm like, you know, uh, you know, cicada killers and all these big, large wasps are out lately, especially right now in the middle of summer. Mm -hmm. Um, so Katie dids and cicadas, all these feed them. Um, but the way that it looks that there's some that are mangled, some left behind, and it, it looks kind to me kind of like birds. Okay. Um, so. All right. My Thank best you. guess. Birds. Okay. We're going to K now, question 912. This is from Christine. We are on our third try of growing edamame in our garden. We've been successful in previous okay. years, but this year has been difficult. We planted at three different times to determine if soil temp was the issue. What ideas do you have? At this time, we have three seedlings. So. Well, I'm guessing it's the weather since, since they've been successful with it before. Um, it's, it's probably the weather and it's probably um, not the heat because that mommy uh, does like the heat. It's probably the dryness, the ground, the, the dry soil, because they do like to be well watered. Um, you don't want to have, you know, a soaking wet soil all the time, um, but they do need to, um, I would uh, urge them to keep, keep the soil damp if possible. Okay. And see what happens. It's okay. been a crazy year for things. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like they were trying a lot of things to test it. So, yeah. One thing I had I had some problems with um, edamame one time, and I've I forgot that I had left some seed left over from the previous year, and the germination rate just was just very bad from the the previous year's seed. So, if they use the previous year's seed, that could be part of the problem too. Okay. All right, we've got two minutes left. One, uh, one more question, and this will just kind of be for everybody who wants to answer. Um, this is from Pam. She says, my service berry tree, she has several concerns about it. Dark areas on the trunk, greenish speckles on the trunk, small cracks at the base, brown spots on the leaves. This tree is just 
not in good shape. She sent some pictures in, so let's take a look at those. Um, and wants to know what you guys think here. She's in a good environment because those are lichens on, on the uh, branch or on the trunk, which means lichens only like to grow when the environment around the air environment is really good. So that's a positive that I see in that. The other thing that I see is the tree is planted way too deep. And I think that's why she's having an issue at the base of the, the tree. Okay, Kelly, anything to add there? Yeah, um, even though lichens are a positive, sometimes lichens on a on a tree is a negative because lichens will slough off when a tree is healthy. They really only stay on when the tree is slow growing. Um, I agree with his assessment of the tree is planted too deep. Maybe you could pull some soil back. Um, usually it's hard to uh, redo that. Um, she also has an apple scab problem, which it, that rarely kills the plant, but um, increasing the health of the plant, meaning watering during time, times of drought, and uh, perhaps doing a bit of corrective pruning in the winter to increase the airflow could help decrease the presence of disease. Okay. All right, guys. Thank you very much for spending your time with us and uh, your talent. And thank you so much for watching. And we will see you next time.